Good evening, welcome to Chatbox with Sam. Tonight's guest is actor, producer, stuntman and musician Tom Proctor. Good evening, Tom. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm fantastic. Thank you very much. I'm very excited about your music and your film background, your producing background, and you're, you're a stuntman, and you wear many hats, and I, th I think the audience are going to be very excited and the viewers to watch this interview. Um, there's many interesting tales from you. I know you love to ride motorcycles and horses. When I moved, I I literally spent more hours on horses and that as a kid. I and trained Liberty horses and and um, movie horses and trained roping horses for some of the top ropers and everything like that. But and then you know went from that and got to a point where for my acting career I had to be in Los Angeles. And what here's what was so hard for me. I went from being on a place where I had horses, sheep, uh, a mountain lion, raccoons, two wolves. Oh, and, beautiful. And, yeah, I had two lobo wolves. Oh my gosh. And uh, that, we, that we used in the movies and everything like that. And, um, you know, and then it got to where my acting, you know, I wanted to get more into the acting and less out of the animal uh, wrangling because it was so spotty. Mm. And had to move to L.A. And the, the first thing that was available was a no pets apartment. You oh, know? no. <laughs> all that to not being around animals at all. But I got cast on enough westerns and that that I was still riding horses. horses. And everything like that. So, Gosh, it was yes. Oh my goodness, I, I I couldn't imagine going through so much. It's like going from freedom to to a cage almost, isn't it? Wouldn't you think? If you saw it, you would know exactly how much that was like that. I mean, I, mean, I went from having property, a place to do everything, a big thing to a studio apartment that was a hundred and uh, no 480 square feet I, I lived in los angeles long enough to where i started thinking man there's just something wrong with me and and it because you're you're with a different culture mm -hmm. that will never understand your culture right you know um i'm really thrilled and proud you know uh you know i see my daughter now and she moved back out in it, you know, where her kids raise and their their own pigs and chickens, and that's and that they raise them for food and everything. Uh, mm. And and I and I go bragging about that sometimes. I says, "Yeah, my daughter just and her daughter just slaughtered their pigs." She goes, "That's terrible! Didn't it traumatize the chi child? That's horrible! That's..." Um, like, but they ate the food. And how do you no, think it gets to the grocery store and you eat it then? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. They're, they're, they're fine with that, if, you know. It came from McDonald's, it, you know, surely was <laughs> alive at one time. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, you're teaching that child, um, I'm sure if they like in the farmers in England, if you respect the animal and don't harm it and don't hurt it, and it is for food, and you kill the animal and then... And it's for food, and that's specifically what it's for. And you treat the animal good while it's alive. You're teaching the child respect and where foods come from. That's no that that is actually got more power to it than just going to the store and buying a steak or a chicken and just seeing it packaged up. Because we're kind of hypocritical creatures when it comes to that. Like, it's like no, I don't want to kill an animal. But you, you, we are contributing to killing animals when we eat them. Yeah, there's a, a one right. friend that tells me, "Well, I don't eat animals. I'm strictly a vegetarian." And I said, "Wow, oh, that's nice." What are your shoes <laughs> made? Of? What, right. what are your shoes made of? Well, they're shoes. Oh, well, that's really nice shoes. They, they're really good shoes. Yeah, they're shoes. Oh, they got leather bottoms on. 
and leather top. Right. Leather. I can tell from here that's leather. Those shoes will hold up forever because it's leather. Right. Well, yeah. And it was <laughs> quite surprised that I was explaining to this 40 year old woman that leather also came from a cow or <laughs> <laughs> the skin. The hide. Yeah. I'm a no-holds-barred fighter. Okay. There's a huge difference. No-holds-barred means no rules. Uh... No categories. No things. The rules of no-holds-barred are no fighting, no eye-gouging. That's it. End of conversation. Unfortunately, I'm the stupid fool that changed the no hold bar to MMA um, because I got tired. We used to hold the, the fights on the Indian reservations and stuff like that. And the only way that the, the opponent lost is if he tapped out or if his corner threw the towel. And uh, warriors are warriors. They're not going to tap out. And sometimes their corner would not throw the towel. And I, I, I will never forget this. Uh, one guy had beat him almost to death. <gasps> and, no. and I'm looking at the referee and saying, call this fight. Do, do something. And I looked over at his corner and I said, throw the towel. Your guy's done. He, he, he can't do anything. Throw the towel. And they said, you, we will never throw the towel. Well, that's brilliant. You know, and um, I was uh, thankful, you know, so then I just had to turn him over and choke him out, which uh, then you don't have to tap. You know, if you, if you, if you choke him out, it's more humane, so to speak. And um, somebody that gets knocked out can't fight for 90 days a after this period. Hmm. So with a, so a group out of Arizona, we started the um, United Sports Combat Federation. And then we got cage fights sanctioned by the Boxing Commission. Mm -hmm. The Boxing Commission would then call a fight. It, it, one of the rules in boxing, if you are no longer able to defend yourself, that fight is over. If you're staggering around, can't defend yourself, that fight's completely over. Right. But when they did that and, and it switched to MMA, they got rules and weight divisions and everything like that. When I when I took the heavyweight and super heavyweight title, I was already 47 years old. Oh, wow. Now, if you add rules back into that, yeah, I can't compete with the young guys anymore. Yeah. I was a very boring fighter. I'd do a bulk of Thor tie up and just trying to hang on the guys and jerk their bodies. <laughs> and, and I would just jerk them around until I, I would see their tongue in her mouth hanging open. I go, okay, now we're the same age. We can fight. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and then there, there was a, another thing that hit me that I really needed to not do. At one time, we were fighting. I was fighting this 19-year-old kid, uh, Joey something. We're standing there, you know, doing the mean look at each other. I'm meaner than you are. I'm meaner than you are. No, I'm meaner. <laughs> <laughs> and then we are sitting there doing that. And he took to me, he says, you're too an old to be in here with me. I went, really? Son, I says, I was fighting. And when your daddy was talking your mama into the back seat to make you. <laughs> no, <laughs> and, and back to the corner. And then my daughter comes running outside the ring, Maggie. And, and, and uh, I think it was Maggie. Maybe or Lisa, but anyway, the daughter comes running outside the ring and saying, Dad, Dad, and they says, No, 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 don't interrupt him right now. And I told my corner, you never stop my daughter from talking. Because if Aww. that means like my daughter, mm -hmm. it, I don't care what's going on. She's talking, we're listening. I said, What's up, sweetie? And she goes, Um, can you not hurt him? I go to school with him. <laughs> I went, no to sell. Daughters do not go to fights. <laughs> well, now you, just, guy, you lost the fight, didn't you? 
<laughs> so now a guy who's made me so angry by calling me an old man, I'm that I'm going to cut him to pieces and kill him slowly. <laughs> now I have no choice but to choke him out and not hurt him because he goes to school with my dog. <laughs> Good story. <laughs> when you get hit hard enough, there's a thing that fighters have expressed to me, uh, gray flash, that you'll you'll see a flash of gray. Well, that's your, you just got knocked out but recouped instantly. That's right. brain damage. And people, the rules of boxing and kickboxing say that you have to stay in that perfect range that I break cinder blocks with my heel kick. You Gee. can't come in to the fetal position and save yourself. Right. You come into the clinch and save yourself. Hmm. Where MMA, you do whatever you want and they're dropping elbows, but they're not any elbows with any hip. They're not a punch with any hip behind. Them. They don't have, you notice all the knockouts of MMA are when they're on their feet, when they're in that fight range. Right. So you look at the guy getting pummeled on the ground, but he's not knocked out. Why? But if you, if you want to know honestly which one is the most dangerous to me, it's the stunt work. Remember the gray, the gray flash that I told you about? That fighters, when they get hit so hard, they see a gray flash? Oh, wow, yes, okay. In all of my fights, never seen a gray flash. Well, that's good. A, a guy in a street fight hit me across the forehead with a baseball bat. Still no gray flash. I'm surprised you're not dead. I him because I got up and knocked the hell out of him. <laughs> but uh, if you look on YouTube, you go to Tom Proctor's famous air ratchet. That was an air ratchet uh, set up by a stuntman, Billy Judkins, who's also passed now. But it was the fastest air ratchet ever done. Nobody's ever challenged it since. No one ever will. Mm -hmm. it's a thousand pounds, two to one, which means when that wire starts, you got a starting speed. With the minute that stainless steel cable stretches as far as it'll stretch, you have a starting speed of 82 miles an hour. Oh, wow. And when that, when I hit that was the first time in my life that I saw a gray flash. And it yanked me up the hill. You can look at it on YouTube. And right. It, I hit the mountain so far I rolled, I blew a hole inside the hill like a meteorite had hit it. Oh, my gosh. And, and then rolled uphill from there. But I got up and I was fine because, you know. Uh, you didn't have a concussion? I, no, I think my mother had sex with a Sasquatch, and that's where I really came from. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've got genetics. You know, the, the, several of my guitars, the King Vulture and some of my other guitars are custom made for me because my hands are so big. What would your advice be to, like, in an acting career or a music career? What would your advice be um, to them? regarding acting in the film industry or a music career? In both, it's going to be the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I've taught acting classes in Central Studios in LA, and I've been to acting classes and everything like this. And, you know, I, I trained in Meisner. And, uh, I saw and, that. I saw yeah. the Meisner. And, and uh, could you please, for the people that don't know, could you please explain the difference between what the miser if, um, effect is regarding focusing on others rather than, could you please explain very, that? Very basically, okay, so there's Meisner, mm -hmm. which, which their main focus is teaching you to listen to the other person. That is the, the main thing, because that's what we really do in a conversation. That's what makes a conversation get real. And then, uh, there's the method actor mm -hmm. that just gripes my butt uh, <laughs> because the method actor thinks he has to actually experience this thing and and you know i've seen method actors slap the shit out of themselves before a thing where they just got slapped <laughs> maybe you want to just try acting mm -hmm. you know uh but an acting is not acting. Uh, when, when I taught acting classes, 
I, I threw out everything because it, it's all about not really acting. And, and people, I had a kid in my acting class that kept trying to get that Tom Cruise smile. Well, don't mistake me for Tom Cruise, even though you'll think I am. <laughs> you know, and, and 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 then you know you got the other ones that want to do Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> I've got wrinkles in my forehead. That means I'm acting. Okay, and and and, and there the thing is is there's already a Tom Cruise. Mm -hmm. There's already a Leonardo DiCaprio. Right. What I discovered is there is not another me, and I don't care who you are. There is not another you so is there any character that you played that you could see your own personality within that in blue ridge um this character wade who it was really unique because i just got off a plane from doing a horror film and one of my music video lost in new orleans my phone blew up. My manager's calling me. She says, hey, do you want to do another film with the guys you did? Let me find out. Okay, sure. She goes, okay, you got to be on a plane in two hours. I said, I just got off a plane in L.A. And she says, uh, here's where your flight is. you got to be there. And you're flying to uh, Blue Ridge Mountain, Clayton, Georgia. You're, you're flying to, to Atlanta. And I says, cool. I literally went to Target around the corner got a suitcase, new clothes, because I didn't have time to wash my old clothes, and back into long-term parking, left the old suitcase, took the new suitcase. And I had just done a guitar gig, uh, you know, a music gig, before getting on the plane. So I had on this leather fringe jacket and all this bling and my signature brown cowboy hat and everything, flew into Blue Ridge, and and I, you guys, she says, you're, you're playing a cowboy. And I said, okay, it's one of those things. I'm going to kill five guys, beat up a woman, and get killed. And um, <laughs> when, when I read the script on the plane, I'm on the plane, literally reading the script on the plane. I go, oh, my gosh, the introduction to my character is that he's a country singer in a bluegrass band. And I think, oh, my gosh, my one song that I got would be for that movie it would just be perfect and you know you you don't want to appear to be arrogant and all that crap when you when you're doing stuff like that so i go in and i grab brent i said brent i said i got something you got to hear you know and i have just this little uh as a matter of fact it was a travel guitar a travel tailor it wasn't even my big tailor and uh I played the song for him, just live, him and the producers, and they says, oh, that's perfect. That's Who owns that song? Who owns, who owns the, the publishing? I said, I do. It's Claire Free. Uh, we can do it. Do you that's to, that's may, the introduction to my character. Oh, my in, goodness. In, in the scene, this thing's moving around a little bit. Do you, um, want, do you want to play it a little bit?
Okay, then see you've got all the qualifications. Just take it from April. <laughs> what is it that makes you want to be an actor? I don't know. I kind of just want to like make people laugh and stuff. Kind of. What is it that you? I don't know. People, it was, it's like they, it, cause like whenever I watch a movie, I always feel like entertained. It's like, like I'm super entertained. And I just want to make people like entertained. Tom Proctor, thank you so much for attending Chatbox with Sam. It's been an honor and a pleasure, and I've had the greatest laugh with you tonight. Thank you so much. Laughter is very good for the soul. It's very powerful, powerful as music. And uh, so thank you so much for being a guest on Chatbox with Sam. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, you know, I feel bad for anybody who's missing your show.